Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, God's grace, His mercy, and His peace have been shown to you through our crucified, our risen, and now ascended Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A few years ago, I was talking to a man from our church who was telling me about a conversation that he had with one of his co-workers. His co-worker was an active Christian, and so many times this member and this co-worker would have conversations about their Christian faith. Co-worker went to church regularly, read his Bible, active Christian. Well, the man from our church told this co-worker that he was looking forward to this coming weekend because in our church services, we were going to be celebrating Jesus' ascension. And the co-worker looked back at this man a little strangely and asked him, why in the world would you do that? I mean, I, I can understand uh, celebrating Christmas and maybe Easter, but Jesus' ascension, why would you set aside an entire church service to celebrate Jesus' ascension? What's the big deal? That man's feelings are not really all that unique or unusual. There are many Christians throughout the world who kind of just look past Jesus' ascension into heaven and, and consider it really no big deal. You and I this morning, we, we might find ourselves still looking back to Jesus' resurrection from the dead, which we celebrated five weeks ago. And we might find ourselves looking forward to Pentecost, which we're going to celebrate next week. And, and ourselves kind of finding ourselves at, at least looking past Jesus' ascension on this day. But today I would ask you to take another look at our ascended Savior and the events of Jesus' ascension. And to think once again to what Jesus' ascension means for you and me. And why it is rightfully absolutely something for us to set aside and to celebrate to celebrate Jesus' ascension in heaven. Jesus ascended 40 days after his resurrection from the dead. And during those 40 days, there were a lot of things that were going on. Jesus was routinely, suddenly appearing and disappearing throughout those 40 days. Jesus, well, we kind of looked at a number of those resurrection appearance accounts over the last five weeks. Do you remember who Jesus appeared to? Well, of course, we have Easter morning. Jesus appearing to a group of women, and especially to Mary Magdalene, and also to Jesus' disciple Peter. We have Jesus appearing on Easter afternoon to two of his disciples who are traveling on the road to a town called Emmaus. We have Jesus appearing on Easter evening to a group of disciples and then once again to that group of disciples one week later. But Jesus did not only appear to individuals or to small groups of people. Not at all. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that after Jesus' resurrection, that Jesus appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Jesus made it absolutely clear on multiple occasions to a diverse group of people that he was most certainly not dead, but that Jesus was absolutely alive. Now those 40 days must have gone pretty quickly for Jesus' disciples. Just think about it. For the last three years... They had spent nearly every day with Jesus. And now Jesus was going to be removing his visible presence from those disciples. Jesus had called those disciples. He had trained those disciples. He had taught them. He had equipped them with that powerful message of the gospel through which the Holy Spirit was able to change people's hearts and lives and minds. Jesus had sent out his disciples on a very specific mission to share that message of salvation in Jesus Christ with all people. And Jesus had also promised a very special outpouring of the Holy Spirit on those first disciples that would 
especially equip them for taking that message of salvation to people of every nation. And so on that 40th day after Easter, Jesus gathers that small group of disciples around him, and he takes them to a very familiar place, to Bethany, to the Mount of Olives, located just east of the city of Jerusalem. And as those disciples look at Jesus, they see him ascend into the sky. And suddenly Jesus is hidden by a cloud. And the disciples, they don't even notice the two angels that are standing there beside them who ask those disciples, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? Whenever I hear that question asked by the angels to the disciples, It almost seems a little silly, doesn't it? What would you be doing if you were one of those disciples? Wouldn't you be staring up into the sky too? I mean, those disciples had seen a lot of unique, miraculous things, but never anything like this before. And so there they are, staring up into the sky, wondering to themselves, where'd he go? Is he coming back? What are we supposed to do now? And so the angels explain. This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. There was no need for those disciples to wonder or to worry about Jesus. For Jesus had simply returned to his heavenly home, to that supreme position of authority over all of creation that was rightfully his as the Son of God from all of eternity. Jesus had returned to his heavenly home because his mission was accomplished. Those words, mission accomplished, those are words that any military commander welcomes to hear. The words mission accomplished means that the operation that that military commander sent his military forces off to do, the operation has been successful. They have done exactly what he wanted. The work is all completed. Jesus' ascension is his announcement to all of the world, mission accomplished. The mission for which God the Father had sent his son Jesus into this world, Jesus had perfectly carried out. Jesus had battled sin every single day. He had fought temptation at every point And he had been victorious at all times. And that's good news for us to hear. Because when you look at yourself, do you see somebody who has been victorious over sin at every point? When we look at ourselves, do we see somebody that has won the battles against temptation at every point? When we look at ourselves, we see people that are striving and struggling to do the right thing and yet probably fail on more occasions than we'd like to admit. We've lost the battle against controlling our anger with a child or maybe our spouse, yelling and screaming and threatening instead of forgiving and loving. We've lost the battle against the alarm clock, hitting the snooze button over and over again not getting up early enough to make it to Bible study on a Sunday morning or maybe a little bit extra early in a weekday morning to read a couple of Bible verses before we head off to work. We've lost that battle at times against the click of the mouse. Quickly forwarding on that complaint gossip-filled email, posting on our Facebook page those damaging of reputation words, or maybe taking us to a website that we know we should be at. And that's exactly why Jesus' ascension is such an awesome sight for us. Because as we see Jesus ascend into heaven, he announces to me that the perfect life that God the Father sent Jesus into this world to live for me, that Jesus has most certainly lived that perfect life that Jesus has been victorious for us. That he never failed. Never a lustful thought, never an angry word, 
never a complaint about learning his memory work or heading off to Sabbath school. No, Jesus was victorious at every point, living a completely perfect life as the Bible declares that we have one who was tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. And as Jesus ascended into heaven, the Gospel of Luke tells us that Jesus lifted up his hands and he blessed them. What did those disciples see when they looked at Jesus' hands of blessing? They would have seen the nail marks. They would have seen the reminders of the cost of that eternal blessing that God through his son Jesus had brought to them. The cost of forgiveness and salvation and being right with God. That that very Jesus was willing to stretch his arms out on the cross to die in our place, to suffer the punishment of our sins. That saving mission for which Jesus had come into this world, Jesus had perfectly executed with his life and his death and his resurrection. His rising from the dead on Easter morning declared it to be true. And his ascension into heaven announces to people of every generation and every nation, mission accomplished. The work of salvation has been fully done by Jesus. Jesus now proclaims to you, you belong to him. So what are you looking at? Well, what were Jesus' disciples looking at? They were looking up in the sky. When the angels told them not to worry, that the same Jesus that they saw ascend would come back, and they would see him again, but this time in glorious fashion, along with all of humanity at the end of time. Those disciples, they had nothing to worry about. But they did have work to do. Jesus did not intend for them to stand there on that hilltop looking up into the sky until he returned. No, he wanted them to go and be his witnesses. To radiate that message of the gospel throughout the world. To proclaim to people, whoever they were, the message of salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So what are you looking at? I think like most parents... After I get home from work, I usually ask my daughters how their day at school was. And I get a couple of different answers. Sometimes I get the play-by-play -play of everything that happened. He said this, and then she said that, and then she said, and then he did, and then she did. And if that's the case, I better get comfortable. Because I know it's going to be about a 20-minute play-by-play of every single thing that happened throughout the day. But other times I get home and I find my kids sitting in front of the TV. And if I ask them then, how was your day at school? The answer is noticeably shorter. Something along the lines of fine, all right, good. And my wife tells me that I exhibit some of the same behaviors. When she asks me a question and I'm watching TV. Maybe you've experienced the same thing. It's awfully easy to become distracted staring at a TV screen or staring at a cell phone that you don't even realize all the different things that are going on around you. Maybe even the people that are attempting to talk to you. So what are we looking at? So often we find ourselves distracted by the things that are going on in our own lives that we fail to look around at the people that God has placed throughout our lives. People that need to hear of the love of their God and their Savior, Jesus. People who maybe themselves have become distracted over time and wandered away from regularly seeing that Savior or actively growing in their relationship with Him through faith. We become so focused on our careers, on our schoolwork, on our relationships, on the difficulties we're having financially or maybe in a relationship or our recreational activities. And while all of those things can certainly be good for us to devote our time to, when they become so consuming, well, they become distractions. 
We become so focused on them that we miss out on the people that the Lord has placed all around us that he calls us to witness to, to simply share with them what we have seen through the eyes of faith in Jesus, the encouragement, the comfort, the faithfulness, the love, the salvation, the forgiveness that you and I have seen in Jesus Christ, our Savior. A couple of years ago, I was visiting a man in the hospital. He has now since gone home to heaven. At that point in time, he had spent the last couple of years bouncing back and forth between the nursing home and the hospital. If there was something that was going to go wrong, it happened to him. And so I went up to the hospital and I went to visit him. And during our visit, there was a therapist that walked in the hospital room and the three of us began to talk. He introduced her, and I, he then introduced me as his pastor. And as our conversation went about, the man said to me, You know, whenever Jesus is ready, I am ready to go home to heaven. And the therapist kind of looked at him and said, Wow, that's confidence to know that you're going to go to heaven? And he looked at her and said, Well, don't you trust in Jesus as your Savior? And the woman, a little startled, said, well, yeah, I, I, I trust in Jesus. I, I go to church and I read my Bible. And the man immediately fired back, well, then you can know for sure that your sins are forgiven and you're going to heaven because Jesus promised it. Did you notice what my part in that conversation was? Nothing. I simply sat there with a really big smile on my face and watched a fellow Christian witness their faith in Jesus. Instead of allowing the very difficult circumstances of his life to consume him and to become a distraction, he looked around and he saw a person who needed to hear of God's love and faithfulness and salvation. And so he simply told her what he had seen, what he had witnessed in Jesus with the eyes of faith. Seeing your ascended Savior regularly does that sort of thing. For we get to see a victorious Savior in the ascended Lord. Somebody who has completely carried out the work of our salvation. And through faith, that victory of Jesus has become our victory. And Jesus sends us out to proclaim that victory of salvation to every single person in our lives. So what are we looking at? Well, we've got work to do. We are witnesses of the crucified, the risen, and the ascended. Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.